Hi, welcome to this week's lab. Um, in my Mac are three different files that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the third file, the Word document, is the one you're going to be submitting. So um, in this lab, you're going to be going through and identifying minerals based on their uh, physical properties. Uh, we're going to be using this semester, we're going to be using this box, and uh, you're going to work independently uh, to identify the samples. And um, so uh, this box is a really, like I said, it, it, it's pretty useful um, because it's going to look at 15 different samples. Uh, they're not the ones on the cover. So um, uh, to make sure that we're identifying the right samples, uh, make sure at the end when you're required to insert an image, uh, make sure you insert that image there. Um, so when we identify minerals, there's going to be a number of different properties that we're going to use. Uh, the first one is to look at um, the color. It's going to be really easy to identify. Now, color is very easy to identify, but unfortunately, it's not the greatest in, uh, in terms of really helping with diagnostics of a, a number of different types of samples. Um, one mineral can have a, all the colors of the rainbow. Um, there are some minerals that are OK to identify by color. Um, and again, it goes with a little practice. So um, what we're going to be doing is uh, looking at the samples, and I've limited your selection. There are thousands, of, about 6,000 different minerals out there right now that we've identified, and I've limited your samples to be, uh, all of the samples uh, are found on this list of, um, that's in your, uh, in the lab assignment. Let me pull those up here. Now, when we start looking at the minerals, uh, we can see that there's multiple pages of this uh, identification guide. The first thing that we're looking at is what's on the top. And this is going to be uh, metallic and submetallic minerals. This is based on um, the luster of the sample, how it reflects light. And then once we have, if it's metallic or non-metallic, now me metal metallic luster means anything from gold, silver, copper, um, bronzy, um, to even do a dirty dirty uh, engine would look uh, would all be in the metallic tab. Um, if it's non-metallic, we've got three pages of other minerals that we've narrowed our samples down to, and. Um, when we start looking at the samples, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is the hardness. Um, again, we're going to use Mohs hardness scale. We're going to take three different categories of hardness. The first one is going to be from one until two and a half. Uh, and that's what the hardness of your fingernails are. And uh, so if you can scratch your sample with your fingernail, your fingernail, two and a half, is going to be stronger than the mineral. And so the mineral is less than 2.2 uh, and a half. Um, if your sample is stronger than two and a half, it is uh, going to not be affected by you filing your fingernails down on my samples. Uh, the next thing that we're going to be using is a glass plate. Now you should have a glass plate in the um, uh, in your lab kit, and when we take a sample to measure the hardness, it's really important. Don't do this to your samples. Don't put the sample, hold the glass in your hand, and try to scrape that sample. Instead, find a flat surface, set the glass plate on the flat surface, and then use the point of the mineral to try to scratch that sample. Again. We don't want uh, the glass breaking and hurting somebody. So as a lab safety, uh, that's that's really important to do. So in addition to the uh, glass plate, uh, which has a hardness of five and a half. So if it's over five and a half, it's going to scratch glass. And so uh, I've listed the samples from um, highest hardness to the lowest hardness of the non-metallic minerals. And let's see, the other thing that we're going to be looking at that's going to help us out is the streak. So to calculate or to determine the streak, you're going to be using the streak plate, again, in the um, zipper pouch of your 
or the pencil box of your uh, lab kit, you're going to take a sample, set it onto a flat surface, and scrape the sample. This is looking at the sample under uh, powdered form as opposed to looking at the color as a whole. And so this is listed as the color of the streak. Um, and so we've got the color and the color of the streak. Um, when it comes to cleavage, there's a lot of different types of cleavage, and this is how a mineral will break. And this is due to the atomic structure of those. And so when we start looking at these samples, um, I've uh, you can look at your textbook and see the different types of uh, cleavage. I'm trying to pull up this web page, and it's showing these different samples. So when we look at the cleavage, it's a, a function of how the mineral breaks. And so if we have the minerals break into pages in a book, uh, this is known as one directional cleavage. If the minerals will break with one, two directions of cleavage, uh, two directions of cleavage, I like to think of like a two by four. It's going to have a top and a bottom that break into flat surfaces and uh, a left and a right. And then, but the third end of that um, two by four in my example uh, is going to be rough. It's going to have no preferred breaking pattern. And so um, a good example of this is our, our feldspars. And there's their feldspars are right, quite common around here. Um, then we have two directions of cleavage, not at 90. And so uh, in this case, we can use our protractor and it's like 132 degrees, uh, 127 degrees. Um, then we have a sample of materials that break into perfect cubes, three directional cleavage, and they're all at right angles to one another, three at 90 degrees. Um, that's where that comes from. And so if we take a look at a, 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 a playing dice, a, a, a one and a six on a die are the exact same surface. And that's how the, the one and the six, the two and the four, the two and the five and the three and the four are those three surfaces or three directions of cleavage. Um, and if they're at 90 degrees one another, they're going to be perfect cubes. If they're not at 90 degrees, if they're more of a rhombohedron, we we note that uh, three not at 90. Now, uh, this one is showing four directions of cleavage. And you do have a sample in your, your kit that does have four directions of cleavage. Um, it's going to have little triangle faces, and that's pretty indicative of this eight-sided um, feature. Now, in this case, it makes it look like all the samples are always going to have the exact same size of cleavage. You can have one sample that some of it's broken off uh, a little bit over here and a lot over on the bottom side, and you can end up with some very interesting shapes that aren't necessarily going to be those perfect octahedrons. Again, we're looking at the way the mineral will break. Uh, and so if you see the same surface and you'll sometimes you'll see cracks running through the rock, uh, the, through the mineral that are all parallel to one another, uh, that would be an example. Now, this uh, web page uh, is not looking beyond four directions of cleavage, but there are minerals that do have more than four directions of cleavage. We'll call those complex and, and we're not going to mess with those too much, but they do exist. Uh, so I do want you to be aware of those. I think something like a diamond has a number of different cleavages cleavage planes. Um, and I want to say 12. But um, the um, if a sample doesn't have a preferred break, it's it has what we call fracture. And so uh, a fracture means there's no preferred break. And so it's not going to have these nice flat surfaces uh, when we start looking at these cleavage planes. That's cleavage. If it doesn't cleave, it's going to fracture. Um, we've already mentioned the luster, how it reflects light. And um, the, 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 the page is defining uh, luster as either metallic or non-metallic. But there's a lot of subcategories. Um, the other one is how does light pass through uh, the samples, whether they're transparent, translucent, or opaque. Um, allows light, kind of allows light, or doesn't allow um, light at all. And then the, la uh, the second to last category is these uh, 
other properties. And these are the unique samples that don't work on everything, uh, but I do want to point out a few of them. Uh, the first one that I want to point out is um, you have a red cap container of vinegar in your lab kit. And that lab, uh, the reason why it's in there is because uh, vinegar is an acid. And so if you put a drop of acid on a sample that will react with acid, like our sample of calcite, it will react. Now, vinegar is not that strong of an acid, but uh, if we had a stronger acid, it would really, really bubble um, like an Alka-Seltzer dripped in, dumped in water. But um, your cases, you're going to get some little bubbles. I just, uh, lab safety, I wanted to uh, use something a little less caustic than hydrochloric acid. So uh, you're using vinegar. So the, the bubbles will exist, but they won't be giant, uh, really, really um, strong. And then the, the next category here is specific gravity. And this is how heavy a sample is compared to water. We did this in the first lab. Uh, I think we looked at a sample of galena and quartz and uh, a rock called limestone, which is made up of the mineral calcite. And so you can see that most of the samples have a specific gravity between two and three. But if you have a sample that feels heavy for its size, go back to the lab one uh, baggie of galena, and you can see that in fact, it is quite heavy for its size. And then finally, uh, the mineral name and uh, the name of these samples. You'll see a lot of them ending in it. That just means uh, stone is, is the origin of that. Um, and so, that is the uh, information on how you would identify these samples. And when it comes time to completing the assignment, you're going to go through and use uh, looking at some of these properties. So you're looking at some samples and identifying them. Uh, the other page that you're going to be using in this week's lab is the um, mineral prop properties of these samples. And I'm going to pull that onto the screen here. And when we start looking at the properties of these samples, I did want to pull, pull these out. Um, they do have some uses of these samples and what the chemical composition is. And so you can see what ingredients are in each one of these minerals. And so you can see um, that silicon and oxygen is quite common in a lot of the minerals around here. And so the, the chemical uh, symbology is right there. And also uh, what we use these samples for. And so again, uh, these are uh, very interesting in that we use these samples every single day. If a mineral, if something that we're using can't be farmed, it must be mined out of these minerals. And so uh, that's why we're looking at these samples. So uh, when it comes time to submitting your lab, you're gonna turn in you're going to identify these samples, um, answer the questions as, uh, as you see, as you're going through, and um, then looking at these samples and identifying uh, the names of this uh, these sets of minerals. Not every one you're gonna to have to identify. Uh, what's the chemical composition? Again, using that chart that's, that's included, and then what are we using them for? So uh, if you have any questions about this, be sure to let me go. Let me know.